Hello and welcome to the Institute for Government for this event, Are Government Departmental Boards Working? I'm Matthew Gill. Departmental boards were introduced to bring external oversight and expertise into central government departments. But how are people appointed as departmental non-executive directors, or NEDs for short? What experience do they bring and what advice do they give to ministers? A recent IFG report found that the system lacks transparency. Ministers can appoint NEDs without due process and their influence depends on whether a minister chooses to engage with them or not. So how can we use departmental boards better in future? I'm delighted to welcome a distinguished panel to discuss these issues. Sue Langley is the lead non-executive director for the Home Office. She's the chair of Gallagher UK and senior independent director of UK Asset Resolution. Thank you for joining us, Sue. Sir David Liddington is former Secretary of State for Justice, Leader of the House of Commons and Minister for the Cabinet Office. He has also been a Minister in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. A warm welcome to you, David. I'd also like to welcome Dame Una O'Brien. Una was Permanent Secretary at the Department for Health for over five years, the first woman to hold that role and has extensive experience in other health leadership roles too. She's also uh, now a non-executive director in various uh, places, including the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. It's good to have you with us, Una. And finally, Miranda Curtis is director at Liberty Global and former lead NED at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. She has also been chair of Waterstones and non-executive director at Marks and Spencers. Miranda, like David, um, is a trustee of the Institute for Government. Thank you for being here, Miranda. Welcome also to our audience online. Please do send in your questions. You can type them into the panel on the right of your screen. You may wish to add your name and where you're viewing from uh, to give us a flavor uh, of, of where you're coming from. We'll be tweeting live from IFG events using the hashtag IFG boards. Please follow and tweet along and we'll have a video and sound recording of the event on our website within 24 hours. I'd like to start by asking our panelists about their direct experience of departmental boards before we move on to discuss how the system might be improved. So can I turn to you first, Sue, as a current departmental NED and ask how you think the system is currently working? What does government want it to achieve and is it doing that? Matthew, thank you. Well, you'll probably get different views from all of the panelists, actually. Um, but I would say generally, yes. Um, I think the challenge is uh, every department is different depending on their portfolio of activities and therefore they want different things from their boards and board members and also there's the, the, the kind of the personalities of the ministers and the permsec and the senior officials um, but we're essentially brought in to provide external expertise as you say and challenge not on the policy of government but on the implementation of it. Um, if I can talk for the Home Office, our NEDs in the Home Office are all very operationally focused. So the key word is delivery. So, you know, we also need to remember that, that I know this session is about the departmental board, but that's just one small part of what an NED in government does. So the majority of my time, for example, is spent either with officials or ministers um, looking at <coughs> programmes, prioritisations, risks, issues, challenges, mentoring some of the senior staff, you know, carrying out a, a review if, if there's been an issue. So the departmental board is, is, is one small part of it. And I think it, in my time, you know, I've, I've seen boards, there's always a core of governance around the board. You will always talk about risk, you know, and, and progress on key issues. Um, but also it depends on the time and circumstances. So in my time, we've done deep dives on a particular issue um, or we may talk about uh, prioritisation of a particular uh, programmes of work or we may talk about culture. So it, it's not kind of a one size fits all. There's a kernel there. Um, but in my view, I think the external expertise that private sector NEDs bring in is really valuable. Thank you, Sue. Um... David, in, in your capacity as a Minister and Secretary of State, what was your experience working with departmental boards? Did, did, did you find them a useful tool for achieving your objectives as a Minister? We still can't hear you, David, I'm afraid. Um, uh, let's see if we can get you back. Um, but meanwhile, um, Una, perhaps I could bring you, you in um, to talk a little bit about um, your experience as a civil servant on 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 departmental boards do you 
do you think that they played a role in improving performance um, in, in your experience? And and did you experience the the health board um, in the way that Sue describes it um, as a as a source of of, of scrutiny and, and governance oversight, or, or or was it involved also in some of the policy issues? Okay, well, can you hear me all right, Matthew? Yes, I've got you. Good, Thank you. Good. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much to, to you and to the IFG for hosting this event. Um, this are a sort of little known piece of the Whitehall scrutiny landscape, and I think it's really good to take this opportunity to shine a light, um, particularly because I think we're around about the 10 year mark now on the new version of departmental boards. Now, my experience was very much in the first five years between 2010, 2016, when um, under the drive um, of both Francis Maud and Lord Brown, um, we in each department made really big efforts to shift the board, both in terms of who was on it and how it worked. So in my case, in, in the department, we'd had prior to 2010, Obviously, we did have a few non-executives, but the board wasn't really attended by ministers and uh, it met fairly infrequently. Under the new regime, we met at least four times a year and it was always a tripartite board with uh, senior civil servants, uh, the permanent secretary and uh, the chief medical officer and a cross section of the DGs and then junior ministers and very much hoping that the Secretary of State would, would come and chair, chair the board. And I think this is where um, there's, you know, when we talk about the future and, and how we're going to take these boards to the next level. One of the issues the IFG has raised is how do we make sure that the boards are, are well and consistently chaired? Because I did find in my own experience very different um, shall we say enthusiasm to engage engage with the board. On your specific question, I th can think of many examples where the board we had, and we had a couple of non-executives from, from banks, we had a former permanent secretary on our board, and we also had someone who was a, a former partner in the firm of accountants. One thing I do remember is they really helped us with uh, e evaluating and managing financial risk, which, as you would expect with the NHS and health, that's a really big thing. And the other, which you know is well well documented, is the um, work that was done to implement the health reforms. And the non-executives were incredibly helpful in shaping the boards of the new ALBs and getting them to work together. So I'd say on the whole, my experience is really very positive. Thanks, Una. Um, David, do we do we have you back? Um, I uh, hope so. We, you, we do, you, excellent. You know. Yes, excellent. Got Good. You. welcome, thank you. So um, <laughs> maybe before we re return to that question, Una, Una was just raising the question about how boards are chaired and obviously that's, that's often ministerial role. So you might have some reflections on that um, of, of your experience of working with was, boards. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think that what, what Sue said at the start, I think is true that different secretaries of state have very different ideas about what the function of a non-executive director should be. And there'll be some who, I hope this doesn't put it quite too, too crudely, but they, they will use NEDs as sort of, um, you know that they will be people that they they want to have people on the board who they feel are going to be committed to the government's um, particular uh, policy objectives. Other ministers will um, perhaps look at it more as a function. The function being to bring in business uh, and third sector expertise uh, to challenge. Um, senior officials in particular, uh, but, but really to, to get to grips with the implementation challenges. I mean, where I found I found them really helpful was was things like you know, looking at risk you know, and, and you know, providing some uh, perspective on how one best manages risks and also in spotting things that they had come across in uh, business lives or their lives. So I can think of one example, for example, cabinet office, where um, we had had a, a report on staff morale, 
Um, and, all, and, and worse than that, there was some reports of a, a, a significant number of staff who were saying they had experienced bullying or harassment. And it was the NEDs, I remember, who at the board meeting really did um, try to deal with these, how they tried to improve the quality of internal communication within their organisations. Um, and, and so I think they do bring the well use that extra dimension. But I think Una, Una is right that one, one's got to have a commitment by ministers to you know, actually turn up. And that's you know, under our system where ministers sit in parliament, that, you know, that is not always easy. Um, but I think unless you have the Secretary of State chairing and the other ministers attending as members of the board on a regular basis, then it just doesn't function properly. Thank you. Uh, I mean, do you think that that ministers hands should be any more tied on the, on those kinds of issues? I mean, thinking particularly about the the variability of of appointment that you mentioned in terms of whether you have people committed to policy objectives or functional experts on the on, on the boards. I mean, there are proposals out there, for instance, to make the process subject to the, the public appointments process or to say, well, if more sort of political allies to put it one way or another are needed, should there be more special advisors? Should that be achieved in some other way than the departmental board, which has this this function? But do do you, do you feel that that flexibility within the board structure is important? I think I think that I mean, the problem with inventing new formal ways in which to manage this is that if if you then end up with a situation where a secretary of state feels they've had a board foisted on them. Who they can't work with and they don't trust. Uh, the board will become dysfunctional anyway, and probably just won't meet. Is probably what will, what the minister will then do is say, right, we're not going to have them, or ministers won't turn up. Um, so, so I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I am a believer in the region of government, and that does require politicians and officials to observe the conventions and, and the difficulties around when if any minister to breach a long-standing convention or to take new powers for the executive they, they need to um, think through the the hypothesis of uh, the their political opponents being in office and exercising those powers um, or disregarding those conventions and to see if they would feel comfortable with that um, I, I mean, at the end of the day just as a minute you know, if a, if a secretary of state, feels that he or she can't work with their permanent secretary, then the permanent secretary ends up moving. And that, just, that always has been the case, and I can't really see any other way in which the situation can work. But I, I think the, the could be more over how you handle ministerial code, how you deal with ministerial training, um, so that you have it's not when they get to cabinet, but but when people are at an earlier stage in their ministerial careers, are actually given some formal training into how, how to lead and motivate a large organisation uh, uh, to get us out of them, and that seems like the right degree at the moment. Thank you, David. Um, Miranda, perhaps I can bring you in at this point um what was your experience as a as a ned on the fco board um what areas were you encouraged to focus on and and, and how was that role used uh, I'd, I'd like to pick up on sue's comment at, at the beginning of the session where she talked about the immense variability in the way different departments and secretaries of state use their boards and i think as a, as, as a general rule those departments that are primarily delivery departments have much greater clarity about how to draw on the specific expertise and skills that the NEDS can contribute. And in particular, I think that every department is pretty good at using the NEDS that they have appointed to cover um, areas of responsibility such as finance, audit and risk, um, and personnel and, and, and people leadership. And those are pretty straightforward. The functional leads, I think, uh, uh, functional NEDS, I think have pretty clear responsibilities right across government. It's much harder, I think, 
um, in policy-led um, departments where it's very much up to the Secretaries of State how much they, they want to draw on their boards and in particular how much they want to draw on their lead nets. And certainly my experience of, of the Foreign Office was that I worked with two Secretaries of State in a row who had no interest at all in engaging in their boards. And the problem with that is that that, that sets a tone whereby the rest of the ministerial team are not interested in engaging with their nets, either at, and in particular outside the boards. And so there's a lost opportunity, I think, in terms of um, the ability of NEDS to contribute, particularly to helping with strategic planning, acting as a sounding board, providing constructive challenge, and indeed um, offering mentoring opportunities. Um, and in that context, I think um, I know that I and other um, lead NEDS in particular probably spent more time with their um, sex than they did with their ministerial colleagues. There are a couple of other comments that I'd like to make, and I think that you know, one of the problems about this conversation is that it tends very much to focus on the intra-departmental relationship of each board with each uh, ministerial team. And my experience was that actually some of the most interesting opportunities arose from the fact that um, through this system, we actually now have networks of NEDs right across the different government departments, either functional NEDs, or indeed lead nets who have the opportunity to come together as a group and are uniquely positioned um, as a group of non-executive directors with very sophisticated and wide ranging corporate experience in really helping to uh, in really thinking through, um, um, you know, they have inter they bring their intimate knowledge of the individual departments, but they can actually think about cross governmental um, challenges in terms of how government could be work, made to work more effectively together, cross-departmental, cross-government issues, common machinery of government challenges, shared perspectives and best practice. And the really important thing about those groups is that unlike, um, unlike senior civil servants or indeed unlike ministers, they've got no skin in the game. They've got, you know, they're not, they're not there to actually, um, you know, uh, uh, obtain preferment. They can really take a truly independent and neutral view of those issues. And then the final comment I'd make, which again is a general one, is that certainly coming from the corporate world, and indeed having worked in third sector and many other, many other sectors and boards around the world, what British government is one of the, is, is an ex, has an extraordinary gap at the very top of its leadership. And I'll pick up a, an expression that I know David Liddington has used. Um, you've got a, a barony of permanent secretaries, a very powerful individuals, each running their own fiefdom. And they work with a barony of ministers who are also equally independent. And at no point I, that I can see is there anyone really driving collaborative team working, either at the ministerial level or at the permanent secretary level, or indeed between ministerial and permanent secretaries. And that's a huge gap because that precisely means that there is an opportunity to, um, to create a, a much more productive working atmosphere in which people really can think about coming together to maximise their skills and resources to achieve a better outcome um, for, for government and, 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 and for voters. And that's a role where I think NEDs and in particular lead NEDs have a massive contribution to make. Thanks, Miranda. Um... Sue, you, you are a lead Ned, um, so I don't know if you want to comment a little bit on how that network across government works and, and the, the what it can and can't achieve. <clears throat> no, I think I think Miranda made um, some really good points there, actually, especially I hadn't thought about it, about the difference between policy departments and operational departments. So in a way, perhaps in the Home Office, it's been easier because we've always had independent operational Neds focusing on delivery. Um, <clears throat> I, I do think that that is a real opportunity. Um, I, I think it, it's it's worked well um, in parts and not in others. It's kind of patchy um, because I also think it depends on the individual NEDs because you can you can bring us together as a group, but we also need to be proactive in wanting to work with each other and looking for opportunities. So you know I I, <clears throat> I know under um, Ian and under John, there have been various uh, cross net programs and projects that we've looked at on arms and bodies and all sorts of things, um, which have which have put recommendations forward. But 
I, I think to me that brings it on to an important point around NEDs because I think I think you, Matthew, said um, some ministers, you know, ministers need to choose to engage. One of the key requirements, I think, for a good government NED is to be proactive and to be able to build relationships, whether it's across the group with other NEDs or whether it's in the department. I mean, very early in, in, in my time in the Home Office, um, one of my fellow NEDs came to me and said, Sue, I've been here six months and nobody has asked me to do anything. And I said, well, who have you met? And he said, well, no one really. I said, well, they won't. Because, you know, it's just just like a private sector board, you know, we all get appointed as a chair or an NED on our career and our, you know, skills and experience. But your first six months of joining any private sector board are about building those relationships, trusted relationships. People know that you have something to add, that you can be trusted, you know, and that you can actually play your part. So so I think back to, to Miranda's point in cross government, I think that's really valuable. Um, but one of the key skills when you're when you're looking at government NEDs has to be the proactivity and the kind of EQ to build relationships both cross government, but most importantly, within your department, any new NED, I say, spend the first six months just getting to know the ropes, you know, go out on the front line, understand how it operates, have something to say and build those relationships with ministers and officials. Thanks, Sue. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how this how, how the system looks and it's obviously bled into discussions about um possible possible change or or or, or reform it so uh, th there's lots of things we, we we could ask i mean one of the things that might be worth just exploring a little bit is that the distinction between um uh oversight from a commercial or um uh risk management perspective and um engagement in policy decision making and where do you think that boards do or should sit on that spectrum yeah, you're addressing that to me, Matthew. Sorry. Yes, in yes. the first instance. Um, but anybody else who'd like to come in afterwards? Sure. Uh, well, I think David put it really well because it depends in a way what the Minister of State wants. I mean, I have a my personal view um, is that we are not there to contribute to policy. Of course, we will all have a view, um, but that would make us political NEDs. We are there to talk about the implementation of that policy or the implications of that policy and therefore to look about whether it could be tweaked in some way if it's high risk or difficult to implement. Um, but I personally, um, coming from a delivery department, uh, think that NEDs should be uh, independent, bring, uh, you know, challenge and oversight from their private or public sector, or whatever their background is, um, and to be based, uh, to, to firmly base uh, their focus on the kind of implementation, but my my colleagues may think otherwise. But if I may, I would, yes. I would completely agree with with what Sue has just said. I think that that dividing line is really important. That's not to say that the ministers in particular don't actually need to have access to um, advisors on policy, and not just. And I think that you know that breaks it down into different areas. And clearly, there's going to be sectoral expertise, and then there are going to be policy experts. But everybody at a senior level in any kind of organisation actually does need a sounding board, does need um, someone you know, to provide constructive challenge, does need somebody you know, occasionally to be able to have a quiet word um, and mentor um, that individual. I mean, there's nothing shameful about it. Um, but that boundary of policy is a really difficult one. And once an NED strays into policy, they cease to be independent. Um, and, and I think they, they diminish their ability to be effective and to fulfil fulfil the, the, their role properly. Thanks, Miranda. Um, we've got a number of questions coming in through the feed, so do keep um, send, sending those in. Um, I'm going to pick up on just one of them because it's exactly on what we're talking about here from Anonymous, um, who says they've worked in public appointments for many years and have seen an increasing political creep into the appointment of departmental and ALB NEDs, which has led, they say, to an increase in cronyism and lack of appointing people who will actually challenge. So, so on this theme, what can be done to ensure the Nolan principles are adhered to? I mean, David, maybe I could just direct that to you. In a, and I guess the more pointed question is, um, there's obviously some flexibility in the way ministers use boards at the moment. Um, but, but the question is, is that flexibility appropriate if it is um, causing the, uh, the, the, the more independent minded aspect of the board to be subordinated to 
um, a, a sort of a, a, a more political special advisor like activity on the boards and is that the place for it? Should there be more constraint over that? I, I, mean, the other, I mean, the straight answer to your question that is, is, is if, it, if that's what happens, then, then it, 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 the system won't work. You'll actually get um, you know, a, board, a board that provides an echo chamber for a secretary of state is going to be pretty useless, it seems to me. Um, and if one wants to have, and I think what, what happens with a, um, <coughs> you know, those, those ministers were looking for uh, people, Sorry, we've lost David again momentarily. For a, are you, are you, are we back now? You're back now, yeah. I'm back Sorry, now, yeah. Just... People are yearning for a cabinet system sometimes. Um, way that um, French government would, would uh, for example, operate, or European Commissioner would operate. I mean, my my own view on this is 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 it comes down. It, 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 you can sort of make tweaks to rules and and so on but ultimately if the minister you, you can you can put as many constraints as you want an appointment if the minister just says no to the shortlist that you produce go back to the beginning um or the board just eases up doesn't function properly then it doesn't get you anywhere it's got to be a cultural understanding which is why i think you go back to um trying to foster uh, a, a a an approach to uh, government that combines collaboration with challenge and sees those two principles as being complementary and the, and, the, and the the necessary tension within them as being as 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 being complementary for and, and, and vital for uh, a healthy um, good quality approach to government. I, I certainly agree with others who said that that we should not. Um, or to Ned's um, determined policy. I mean, as soon as you drift into that uh, uh, way of thinking, then you raise the questions about whether Ned should have a parliamentary confirmation hearing um, before their appointment. Uh, you know, whether Ned should be accountable before select committees uh, for what they've um, uh, said and, <laughs> and, and supported. So I, I just think that you know, it, the principle that it's ministers who are accountable to Parliament. Uh, and the accounting officers accountable to the um, the uh, the the uh, PSC is is good one, but I think it, it, what one could do is build on what Miranda talked about, which, where where you've got now these networks of serving and former non-exec directors who have expertise in particular functions of government. Uh, I think that advice from those groups, sounding boards made up of those people would be very useful to people in number 10 of the cabinet office under any government um, and could also be brought you could provide the nucleus of work to give provide modules or thing I, I I've tried inadequately to to sketch out so that when you get a new minister in who has suddenly got um uh, responsibility for a major area of public spending and the work of a lot of public servants that you give them you know a day or two days with people of this kind with that with a ned and private sector experience to actually enable them to be better ministers i mean the armed forces do this uh, and i think in the, if you like the civilian side of the public sector we ain't as good as the armed forces uh, are actually sort of training leadership, certainly in politics, it's 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 it it, it can be very random. Thanks, David. Um, so yes, a, a, a range of skills needed um, to to support um, leadership in, in in these areas, and that pulls on a question that, that's coming actually, um, which I'd, I'd like to maybe maybe bring Una uh, in on as well, which is how can we ensure that boards reflect the wider public that departments represent? And that's questioning it in a way we've we've sort of taken as read in this conversation that the private sector expertise is really important on these boards. Yes. Um, but of course, there's also civil servants on the boards. And there's a question here about whether there should be people from other walks of life on the boards as well. How did you experience that balance? And do you think it's right? Yes, well, I mean, it's a really great question and something that I've been thinking about to say, first of all, on the just to 
on political advice, I, I think we're in danger of eliding two separate things. Uh, it is a genuine point that if um, ministers, secretaries of state feel they need access to more political advice, that needs to be addressed as a question in itself. I think fusing that with the role of the board is, is really unhelpful because it, it it's, it means that both the political advice and the role of the board are going to be less than the sum of their parts. So I, I really would encourage, you know, more openness about the question of have we got the structure of special advisors right? What more needs to be done on that? We've had a go at some form of cabinet which lasted a couple of years but didn't really come about. So I'm, I like to think that that needs um, a separate discussion in, in its own right. Um, when it comes to members of the board, it's very, very interesting to um, see that the, I'm, I'm pleased to see that each year the lead NED for all of the NEDs in government publishes a report about the work of the NEDs. And I do encourage anyone to have a look. I don't think there was one for 2020 for obvious reasons, but it gives an incredibly rich account of the work the NEDs are doing, including um, what Miranda and Sue have been talking about, those groups that work across government to just to give examples, major projects um, uh, that lots of work on talent, lots of work on supporting uh, departments around implementation of their single departmental plans. So that's a very rich uh, contribution from the NEDS. But to the question, I think there's a big southeast dimension to the board members at the moment. Um, obviously, they've been constructed, so it's been easy for people to turn up in person. But I would certainly like to see more uh, determined attention to make sure that there are people contributing from different parts of the country. And indeed, where a department has a UK wide responsibility, for example, the Ministry of Defence and I understand DWP, there should, of course, be um, input from the whole of the UK. So we haven't really paid in so many dimensions of government enough attention to place. And I think that that certainly could be addressed in the next phase of, of recruitment. Thanks, Una. Yeah, uh, it's helpful. Um, I'd like to uh, turn to Miranda now. There's a there's a question um, that's been um, has the most likes, in fact. So do upvote questions that you like the look of in the audience and we'll, we'll try and ask them, um, which is how are departmental boards held to account, especially if their advice results in a poor outcome? And I wonder, Miranda, as well, if that might be an opportunity to reflect a bit more generally on the distinction between these public sector boards and private sector boards uh, and what, what more that, that can be learned from the private sector experience. Of course, because and naturally in the, in, the, in the private sector, the board, as it were, has ultimate liability and responsibility for every aspect of the performance of the organisation, from compliance through to financial performance through to ESG objectives. And so it takes those responsibilities very seriously. And I think it's interesting that you know, people like us who come into government come in with that mindset. And we have to learn to, 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 to step back a little from, from that. Um, and as, as Una said, um, you know, we certainly report um, publicly um, on the contribution that each of us makes, but we don't get to assess the performance of the board as such. And there is, a, I think, there is a, there is a vacuum in the sense that there is nobody who really um, takes responsibility for that. If the minister is generally the chair, the chair that that's not a chair who is taking responsibility for monitoring the the impact of that board. I mean, the, it's a process responsibility rather than an outcome responsibility, if you like. And that's very, very different from, from, from the role of a chair in the public sector. If I may, I just also would like to just pick up on a point that David was making about you know, there being you know, opportunities for current and, and previously serving NEDs to, 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 to provide a real, make a real contribution to government in different functional areas. You know. But I was also thinking about, you know, as it were, special projects. Um, and a good example was the FCO DFID merger. Now, I'm not the only net in the network with extensive experience of cross-cultural mergers um, and working through all the operational, financial, cultural and synergistic um, opportunities and challenges that the process of merger creates. In an ideal world, it would have been great to, for 
government ministers to have been able to plug into the NED network and set and put together, as it were, a task force of people with relevant experience to advise on that process and to bring in the best best practice from around the world and from um, and, and from people's own experience to make that a really effective, uh, effective process. And I can think of a number of other dimensions where that would have been useful. Um, looking at the questions, there's there's one, and we may have covered this already from Martin Wheatley um, around the the exclusion of boards from uh, policy issues. We've discussed the the, the distinction between between um, policy and oversight, and I think the the, um, the what I was hearing from the panel was that that is an important distinction, but it's important not to assume that they can be formally separated um, entirely. But I wonder whether anybody wants to say any more on that question before we move off it completely. Well, just to add, if I may, Matthew, yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about them as though they're entirely separate tram lines and they're not. And, you know, a classic example is as um, going back to my own experience in the Department of Health, as we started to implement the major health reforms of that era, we there was information and evidence coming back about the degree to which they were working or not working. And that was something very much uh, discussed by the board when we looked at performance. So there was a feedback through NEDs to, to ministers. And, and just to uh, take the moment to emphasise one point, I don't think it's come out very strongly yet, is that NEDs can be real, almost compatriots to the permanent secretary and the senior team at times when the evidence is there to really speak truth to power. And that role that NEDs can play, I, I found to be immensely valuable. So you don't get into in, in a really difficult place um, the, a, a, an old story about Perm Second Minister not getting on. The NEDs have really contributed in all sorts of unknown ways to um, saying what needs to be said and in keeping the relationships functioning. So um, I, I do think there is a, a loop from implementation back to policy that's unavoidable. Could I um could I just endorse exactly what um Una says? I think it's um you know earlier when I talk about it, it's our role to highlight the implications of a policy and therefore policy may well be tweaked or refreshed. And I couldn't agree more uh, with Una when she said it's our role to speak truth to power. I mean we are we are there to be independent. So if there is a situation uh, where some of the officials find that for various reasons it might be difficult to say something. I personally see it as my role to actually say that I am the independent and I am the one that should be able to go and speak to the ministers and 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 basically lay out the evidence. If I could just add to that as well, I, mean, I think you know, it's a really important point about you know the opportunity for lead NEDs and NEDs you know to be to be there for their perm sex in particular when dealing with very challenging issues. I talked earlier on. Um, about the idea, of, you know, the, the fact that you know you have this barony of permanent secretaries, you know, which makes them sound, you know, powerful and 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 kings of kings of their realms. In my experience, permanent secretaries are some of the the loneliest senior executives that I've ever come across, um, and they really need someone very often to talk to, and they need someone who to talk to who understands the issues they're dealing with in the context in which they're operating and can help them think through how to address their challenges. But they don't, as in, they don't work, they don't operate, and I go back to my point earlier on, they don't operate as a team. So I haven't seen at that level of government the kind of mutual support that you'd very often see in an executive team in a corporate environment, or indeed in the third sector organization. And I think that that's a real challenge that, um, that needs to be addressed, and the NED network is a really could make a really important contribution to that issue. Thanks, Miranda. Um, we, we spoke earlier in the session about the um, the need for proactivity on behalf of board members to get to know people in the department to find out where they could be useful, and I, I wanted to bring in a, another question we, we've we've got, which which would give a different sort of perspective on that. The question is, do you think departmental boards are getting the quality of 
finance and performance information needed to hold departments to account. So is there something about boards getting information or being provided information that enables them to form a view and then to engage with the with the issues? Um, Una was nodding. Do you want to come in first, Una, and then Sue? Yeah, well, just to um, give a little bit of background here. I mean, the whole beginning around having NEDs, in my experience, um, going back probably 15 or 20 years, starts with uh, someone to chair an audit committee in the department. And really the sort of in, incoming of NEDs to, to a large extent in health grew, grew out of that. Now, people who um, attend departmental audit and risk committees will know something of a shock that um, alongside the officials from the department and nowadays NEDs, at least one of whom is on the departmental board, also sit um, a senior person from the National Audit Office. So this in itself acts as a, a check, if you like, on the uh, financial information coming through to the board. The audit committees have a big responsibility under the accounting rules set by the Treasury to clear, oversee the development of and clear the department's accounts. So I certainly think that as far as the formal finances of the department are concerned and the systems for managing finance from the time I was permanent secretary, I was pretty confident that um, very comprehensive and um, honest information went to the board but but it's rooted in the the audit committee and the audit committee chair also sitting on, on the board thanks Una. um so did you want to come in and then miranda does as well sure uh, well matthew this is a whole other topic information not data um i i would say that we don't necessarily have the right information we do when we do a deep dive and look at particular risk or a particular topic then the data is normally very rich but i think one of the roles of an ned is to try and drive uh, the right data or the right kpis across the department because um in in my experience especially perhaps with ministerial and, and official churn People make attempts at it and new data is brought in and the minister wants to look at something in a specific way and then the team changes but the information doesn't change and the next the, the next set of ministers that come in would, would like to look at something in a slightly different way so you get these layers of an onion built up until you had this huge mass of data but you don't have the key kpis that we would look for in private sector so ideally in a government department i personally would love to see a balanced scorecard that's you know the perm sec and the ministers come in every day and they can bring it up for an operational department on their screen and see you know is it green red or amber how are slas running you know what are our turnaround times now i, I think departments are getting a lot better at that and we definitely in the home office have far more kpis um but i think there's still a way to go Thank you. I'm in, I'm in violent agreement with Sue. And she said much of what I was about to say, which is essentially that you know, government on the whole is drowning in data, but the analytic capacity to really draw out the information that's required to support excellent decision making is rarely there. And the real shock, which is something we've talked about at the Institute of the Government, around the Institute of the Government board table many times, the real shock for someone coming in from the private sector to government is that there is no single chart of accounts across government that actually tracks financial data in a consistent way across government. So there's basically no single place in government other than National Audit Office passively recording, post hoc recording of expenditure activity that actually manages the finance, where, where the finances of government are actively managed. And there's no single place where you can look at com comparative KPIs for example, between the Department of Health and the Department of Education when looking at childhood obesity. I mean, there's no there's no easy way to actually access the data that would really support excellent decision making. And for coming from the private sector, that's really, really difficult to deal with because one is used to be able to both to, to shape and then draw on the information one needs to support the decisions that, that are required to maximise the performance of the organisation. I, I mean, I, Matt, I certainly found the that one of the things that the NEDs brought was um, pressure on departments to pressure on departments to clarify their thinking 
and to provide much greater uh, clarity and more f and, and focus to the presentation of information, including benchmarks and uh, and financial reporting, and actually getting to. And I can remember meetings where <coughs> it was the, the Neds who would sort of interrogate the permanent secretary or the, you know, the, the the civil servant who was the effective CFO of the uh, department um, about some thing that there was better on page three uh, of the paper. And I thought, what does this mean? And is this a real problem or not? And if, and I think if, if you are a new secretary of state going into any department, I mean, one bit of advice I would I would give would be you know, at the very early stage to your lead non-exec director and get a feel from them as to how and what difficulties, weaknesses, challenges might have been. So come in as a new minister, you might know very little about the department that you've suddenly been appointed to lead and the minister's office the number 10 and you're expected to take charge immediately and, and the next day it hits you. I mean my first after first day in the cabinet office um I always remember John Mann sorry we've lost you can you hear me now uh, you're back, yep, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me now? No, right. no, John Manzoni coughed, said, Minister, I'm going to need to have a word with you about Carillion. Um, they're going to go bust a, a COBRA meeting to decide whether our contingency plans are up to scratch. And I'll need to ask you to take a decision on whether we bail out Carillion or not. <laughs> that is within Two hours of department. Now that perhaps not one an illustration of where Neds would have come in, but actually it's an illustration of how a new Secretary of State could suddenly be plunged um, a major major crisis. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, you're using Neds well to help you navigate through those early months when you are swamped by information, you're meeting lots of different people and you're trying to work out which ones uh, people you should listen to, which issues are important, which bits of information you need to track. That is something where NED advice can be extraordinarily helpful to ministers. Thanks, David. Um, I want to ask a question here, um, which which follows from this in the sense that we've we're listing out really a lot of things that NEDS can help with. And uh, the question is, um, you know, th these are part time roles. It's from Brian Frost. Uh, sometimes they're very part time roles. And I've certainly heard a lot of stories about these roles taking many more hours than they're budgeted to take. Um, is it right to be selecting NEDS from full time executives? And do they really have the bandwidth to do the, the role properly is the question. Um, I might. Yes, that. Miranda. Yeah. And it, it's, it is pretty standard practice in the private sector for senior level executives to have one or two external non executive roles. And it's considered that it's something that enriches them, enriches the organization, increases their, their, their skills, um, allows them to broaden their horizons. And it is assumed, I mean, if you like, that the rule of thumb for most non exec roles. On a, on a private sector board and indeed in government would be 20 days a year. It doesn't end up being 20 days a year. It's an hour here, it's an afternoon there, it's whatever. And inevitably the commitment is as long as a piece of string. But um, part of the risk also of not having people in full-time employment is that you end up people either who are at a very at a later stage in their career and perhaps not completely current, but also you end up only with people who can afford to do it. Um, and that's not necessarily um, healthy, I think, for the organization. So I would argue that most organizations would recognize that having their senior executive take, taking on a role like this is actually valuable for them and valuable for the organization. Thank you. Um, a question from, sorry, Sue, do you want to come um, in first? I, 
yeah. well, I was just going to build on um, Miranda's. Um, I agree. I mean, I know very, very few NEDs in government who only spends 20 days a year. You know, we probably, to be perfectly honest, all you know, in the delivery departments, it's probably much closer to a kind of a day a week. It's an hour here and out there. It's things in the evenings, things at the weekend, but it's it's much more intensive. Um, I I agree with Miranda though. It's really important. Um, if we spent more time, I think we would question the independence. You almost become part of the department, and we still need to to uh, to do other roles. Um, and I'm also I, I I feel very passionately as well. We we cannot allow these roles to become just for people who can afford to do it. I mean, I do a lot of speaking on social mobility as an East Ender, you know, so I feel very strongly about that. Um, so I think it's really important that uh, we bring in private sector people that still have other interests. Thank you. Um, question uh, I'd like to ask is from Jamie. Um, uh, and this is for Una in the first instance. He's asking about uh, the accounting officer construct. Has it had unintended consequences in dampening cross-government collaboration? And does that ever come up around boards? Uh, I'm just pausing for a moment to think about how to, to get into this. Um, and I, I know, um, I mean, it's been very, very interesting today to hear particularly Miranda talk about the degree to which there are these, if you like, baronies. This is a very deep issue um, that isn't just about the money, how money is distributed between government departments and then how that accountability works to parliament. It's also about how the legislation is um, conducted. For example, in health, if you look at the body of health legislation, um, it always refers to the authority of the Secretary of State for Health. So the, the, the legal construct of the powers of the Department of Health are vested in the Office of the Secretary of State for Health. So we've basically got, um, you know, a 20th, a uh, late 19th century form of government for a digital age. And we're desperately trying to work out how to overcome though that infrastructure, which is going to be very, very difficult to, to change. I, I mean, I think the people who work within it, in my experience, both um, while I was there and now I do a lot of coaching of senior leaders across government, is that they do understand the, um, the the problems that this causes. And there are, in the same way that Miranda talked about the, um, the networks that bring together uh, NEDs, there are very extensive networks that are bringing together um, senior civil servants from across different departments. Not really good enough yet. You know, if you look at some of the big problems the country is facing, we still tend to vest the work inside individual departments, something I'm passionate about, which is healthy weight and obesity. Um, there should be a major cross government project on that. So we're trying to work around the baronies, but I, I, I don't think anybody has yet come up with a way of handling accountability for public money that's better than the one we've got, albeit we can see the weaknesses in it. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment on that point? It is it is primarily a civil service point, but uh... yeah, I'm... Matt, Matt, can I come in? Can I come in on that? That yeah. one, please. So this is touching on a a, a sort of B and B. Uh, this is touch on a B I've had in my bonnet for a a good long time, um, which is that the way in which this is aspect we do government in this country is that we decide policy, we decide the implementation of policy. And we decide the allocation of finance very largely in three separate silos with processes that almost never join up. Um, and that leads to, to the ridiculous situations where the, the Treasury does a series of bilateral negotiations with the departments in their spending round, figures are massaged to fit convenient assumptions about inflation and, and, and overheads and and so on, because both sides want to do the deal. Um, they work out how the department has to work out how to implement it. Um, and and, and the, the, so, but the, so the money is not realistic. Realistic sums of money are not attached to an operational plan to deliver a policy objective. The system is not joined up and that's 
in part how you get the series of procurement disasters that um, PACs under successive administrations have recorded um, because uh, the, the, the bidders deliberately pitch low, the department as long as it fits the control total is happy, the treasury as long as it fits the control total is happy and two years or five years down the line some of these projects all go belly up and they cost a lot more um, when they have to be to be rescued or abort at stage. So I, I, I think that strengthening the functional aspects of government, bringing in those networks Miranda talked about earlier is part of the remedy here, but above all it, it also needs a bit of bit more coordination at the centre of government where number 10 and the cabinet office hand in glove the treasury actually sees itself um, as not the centre of government um, working to, to, to achieve good outcomes through a plan process not as I mean as, as I think too often is the case where the treasury Baron, not the equivalent of the medieval prince bishops of Durham, um, you know, seeing itself as having a sort of semi-autonomous status within within Whitehall. Act actually, we should be able to do things a lot better than that. Thank you, David. I'm going to squeeze in one last question. We're almost at the end. Um, this is coming from uh, anonymous, and it's really taking us back to the the question of appointments. Given the importance of these boards, uh, there's a concern that experienced people will not apply if they perceive that, um, for instance, the example being that after a role's advertised at the Department of Health, Matt Hancock appointed a close friend before the advertised deadline. So how can we make sure that people have confidence in uh, these positions and want to apply for them? Is there a case for regulation by the Commission of Public Appointments, for instance, or something else that we do? I don't know, David, if you want to take that first, but others may want to come in very quickly on it. Oh, well, if I may, just quickly, sure. um, uh, Matthew, I just want to say that I think the IFG's put out an excellent report on this very subject. I wouldn't go quite as far as you're suggesting um, on all the aspects of the government. Certainly, I think it's too soon to say lead nudge should appear before select committees. I mean, really, that's that's going to have a, a big dampening effect. But I definitely think that we need more transparency and we need a, a more frequent and transparent uh, declaration of interests. Um, we do await the report about the Department of Health because I think there should be some important lessons to be drawn from that. Thanks, Una. Um, David, did you want to come in on that? Or anybody else? I mean, some of it would be repeating what I uh, some of what I, I I said earlier about my, my suspicion, you know, going, going too much. No, but I agreed what what um, Una said there, um, and, and I think the transparency is usually the not just the the best disinfectant, but it's also the best um, against conspiracy theories taking wing. Um, you know, most of government is 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 um, far more boring than the, the 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 journalists like to make out um and where things go wrong you know 90 percent of the time it's a car cut not a conspiracy and human beings make mistakes in any organization i thought you know, the point jeremy hunt has made frequently about the uh health service it's a good one that actually government should not just well when a disaster happens and something goes wrong they don't look for scapegoats. They analyze what happens and put it right and build in improvements to the system to avoid repetition. Many thanks, David. Um, Could I, um, Sue, go for it. Just, just to add really, really quickly. Um, I mean, I, I agree with everything that said, you know, transparency is key, but but for me, it's how do we, how do we broaden the appeal of the NED network and how do we get that out there into the real world? Because not not many people even knew that the government have NEDs or you know how to apply so you know being an advocate of diversity you know I think it's also responsible on us as a as a network to talk to people we know and try and promote you know these fabulous roles really interesting roles where hopefully we can add value and bring a wider diverse set in and as David said then to avoid the conspiracy theory. Thank you Sue. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, well, thank you, Sue, and thank you, everybody. Uh, there's much more we could discuss here, but unfortunately, we have run out of time and we're going to have to finish there. Um, apologies if we didn't get to your questions. I tried to combine some of them and cover what we could, but uh, for those we missed out, uh, apologies that we ran out of time. Um, my sincere thanks to all our speakers, Sue Langley, David Liddington, Uno O'Brien, Miranda Curtis, and of course, thank you again to everyone in the online audience for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>